Shall we get started? We've reached 12 o'clock GMT, but I can see the attendee numbers rising still, so we'll take a slow start. Firstly, welcome to everyone who's tuned in live to watch and take part. I have the simple job of introducing the webinar, then we will hand over to our two expert speakers before going straight into a question and answer session. To conclude, my colleague Phil, also on the webinar, will provide an overview of the upcoming opportunities from the Society. For those watching the webinar as a recording, if you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. My contact details are displayed on the screen. The Society of the Environment holds a Royal Charter, which was awarded in 2004. We are the custodian of two professional registrations, the Chartered Environmentalist CM Register and the Registered Environmental Technician RM Tech Register. The Society operates as an umbrella organisation, currently with 25 professional bodies acting as constituent bodies. All of these bodies currently hold a licence to award the CM registration to their members. Three of these also offer the RM Tech registration, which are now highlighted. The total number of CMs and um, B Techs currently adds up to nearly 7,500. This is the final part of our new three-part webinar series themed around innovations, the good, the bad, and the game-changing. Today, another two Chartered Environmentalist CM speakers will explore emerging technologies and the innovations that have made a real difference to the environment. Our CM speakers are specialists in their field, but they'll provide the perspectives from different sectors, which makes for an interesting debate. This is the format today's webinar will take. I'll very shortly be handing over to our first speaker, David, to start off proceedings before handing over to Karen. I shall introduce our speakers in a bit more detail before their talks. Our first speaker today is David Stubb, CM, a Chartered Environmentalist via and founding member of the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, SAIM, and the first person to be awarded Chartered Environmentalist of the Year. David is a leading authority on sustainability in sport and global mega events. He led the award-winning sustainability program of the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games, widely recognised as the most sustainable games in modern times. Over to you, David. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So uh, you've um, perfectly introduced the fact that I was uh, leading on the sustainability program for the London 2012 Olympic and Paralympic Games. And since that time, I've continued to work in the sport and event sector, uh, provide a lot of advice to the International Olympic Committee and other major sporting and indeed business and other types of events. So uh, very much want to give an overview of how sustainability has been um, able to um, feature in the event sector and um, some of the, the changes and things that it's been able to drive. So is there such a thing as a sustainable event? It's um, not perhaps an obvious thing. Uh, you think of all these resources and all the people coming together for a very particular point in time. And if you just look at it as a single spike, then it would be very hard to see that in sustainable terms as so much resource is used. But if you look at it, unpack that and look at it on a broader scale, can the overall benefits of these mega events outweigh those impacts? And indeed, can these events really drive meaningful change? And if so, who's benefiting and over what time frame? We don't just look at it at the moment of the event, but over a much longer, a longer period. The, the term used in the event sector is very much legacy. And that's really something for any project that has a defined time frame. What what's left behind afterwards and does it matter people sometimes think sports events and other forms of entertainment they're a good thing in their own right do they need to embrace sustainability what are the opportunities and risks and so on so let's explore that in a little bit more detail i want to now take you back in time to uh, um, a period when i think the country our country was very much uh, all at one and um, uh, came together brilliantly to, to celebrate the London 2012 Olympic Games. In this picture you can see here, there's a whole range of different sustainability features. I'm just sort of leaving this slide up for a few seconds. Normally when I have a live audience, we spend a lot of time on this one, trying to pick out all the different features. 
but uh, this is something maybe you can do later at leisure if you want to download the presentation and, and go through it again. So just some of the things. The big venue on the right-hand side was the water polo venue, built temporarily because there was no long-term need for a venue there. That space is allocated for other purposes. So you don't build what you don't, what you don't want to keep. You just use temporary structures. The bridge across the river. This, this was interesting on the site because of the volume of people required, that were going to be there for the games. We needed wide, large bridges. But in the legacy phase, they were not going to have such large crowds. And it was felt, well, let's have part of the bridge temporary that can be downsized for the, the permanent construction and therefore not having such large, uh, wide stretches of river sort of shaded out. We, we heard in the, the news today that um, health and well-being benefits from a 20-minute walk in the park. Well, having green space and uh, parkland landscaping is an essential part of, of any experience. There was all sorts of technicalities from the, the way the, um, the river was revegetated, the energy centre in the background, which was providing a combined cooling heating power system um, across, the, across the site, and all sorts of perhaps softer things you wouldn't necessarily see in this photo, but down to the types of recycling bins we had, the merchandise in the store that was responsibly and ethically sourced, all the wayfinding and signage, the accessibility across the site, the, the recycling of materials and reuse of materials that had come from the demolition. There's a whole range of things that just in that one picture you could talk about for ages, but we don't have time for that. So looking further ahead, um, transport, mobility is one of the, the key aspects of, uh, of such large scale events. And nearly all of the big ones now require that people come by public transport and, and other soft modes. But there's also the whole question around the fleets of vehicles and logistics vehicles and uh, longer distance travel. Uh, how, do, how do goods and materials and people get to, to and from the event? And the challenge is very much around the types of vehicles you're going to use and the fuel types and, and can, um, at the scale of a large fleet, for a short period. In London 2012, I think we had over 4,000 uh, cars just for the Olympic fleet. Um, that is a lot of vehicles. And if you had them all as electric and all recharging in a fleet depot, that's a lot of infrastructure in one place, which might not be appropriate for legacy configuration if you want to have a city with uh, a much wider rollout of um, electric vehicles. And a lot of these events, there's an example here from Rio 2016, as well as uh, the Javelin train from London and many others. They tend to be an opportunity to catalyze the development of um, public transport infrastructure, uh, whether it's bus rapid transit or new metro lines, what have you. So um, there's a way that the event can really catalyze and bring forward uh, much needed urban infrastructure. An area that's not often thought about. Um, is, is catering and the whole food and beverage offer. Um, hospitality is one thing, athlete dining is another, but not many events really looked at catering for the, for the public in terms of the choice and variety um, that's, uh, that's available, the affordability, and also the, um, the sourcing behind it, the whole responsible sourcing aspects. So in London, we pioneered a food vision which looked at things from ensuring that all the sort of meat and dairy and fresh produce was uh, British farm assured. If it couldn't be from that, we'd look at fair trade certified produce from overseas. And all the fish and seafood was Marine Stewardship Council certified. And interesting enough, the, uh, the work we did with the um, MSC has and uh, sustain a, a really important NGO in that field has led on to a legacy program called Sustainable Fish Cities, and that's still going strong. And with catering, you also have to link to the waste management. So when when your your meal's over, where do you put all all your, your rubbish? And we had a color coded system on the cups and the, the the cutlery and the plateware and all that, which matched the color coding on the waste bins. And we had a organic 
composting um, waste stream as well as the, uh, the dry recyclables. And that was really important that all the materials were um, aligned with that waste those waste streams so that you could maximize the um, recovery rate for, for recycling or composting. Other things, details down to sourcing of the, of the flowers for the, the bouquets with the medalists. The, the medals themselves, we worked with our partners to trace the origin of the metal from the mine to the mint so that we knew exactly where the materials had come from. Uh, the bottom left picture is a little snapshot of the look of the games and for the first time the London Olympics and the Paralympics were an integrated event so that there was a common branding and rather than redress all the city for the Paralympic Games, the, the two were integrated together. And the uniforms for all the games makers and uh, the volunteers and the staff working on the project, they were, um, we worked with our partner supplying those to make sure that they were sustainably sourced, large proportion of recycled element in, in the materials. They, the factories where they were made were, were audited and um, checked for compliance with ethical trading standards and so on. And it's also about ensuring accessibility and a welcoming environment. So a games mobility service and the, the legibility of the, the whole site and the, the wayfinding, as well as the, uh, the numerous volunteers we had, many of them from the local community, and the way that they helped create an atmosphere and uh, an ambience, which was, was really special. Even down to security, this is an aspect which um, is not often thought about in terms of perhaps sustainability, but it is very much a key thing that you have a safe and secure atmosphere. And sometimes you go to events and you see police patrolling around in almost right gear with machine guns, and that is not the most reassuring thing. But uh, you've got to have good security. That may be in the background, but sort of the front of house um, approach needs to be a much more reassuring and, um, and friendly um, way of look, doing things. And then if you've got all those basics, all the fundamentals in place, you also got the opportunity to leverage a profile event. And this is where the mega event really can make some big difference because they are a platform. They have a huge media following, the broadcasting around the world, plus the thousands, tens of thousands, in fact, 10 million tickets were sold for London 2012. So you're talking a really big audience. And that is an opportunity to, to tell that story. And using ambassadors, we used a number of um, relatively high profile uh, sustainability ambassadors, people like Jonathan Porritt, Tim Schmidt, the Eden Project, Deborah Meaden, Kevin McLeod and others. And um, more recently, there's been much more drive to get uh, sports uh, athletes involved in uh, sustainability campaigns. And so the Clean Seas campaign, which the UN Environment has been developing and they work closely with the International Olympic Committee and many other international sports federations. And here's a, a French surfer who is um, promoting the, um, the whole Clean Seas initiative to try and uh, remove plastic pollution from the oceans. And just even more recently, UN um, Climate has um, developed a Sports for Climate Action initiative, in, again in partnership with the IOC and a number of other sports organisations. So driving some of these really critical current contemporary issues on climate change and plastic pollution, using sport as a, as a vehicle for, for achieving that. Sometimes you have really good flagship initiatives so that... Um, in Tokyo, coming up next year in the Summer Games, they're using recycled components from, um, electro, uh, from basic mobile phones that people have donated to, uh, to create the uh, metal, to extract the metals for, for the medals. And you can also think of it in terms of making a statement. Now, that can have two ways of meanings. In Beijing in 20, 2008, they had a 300 ton cauldron mounted on the roof of the Bird's Nest Stadium. That is a lot of weight to go on a very heavy load bearing roof and it used an awful lot of fuel to, to create the flame. In London, we didn't have a stadium with a heavy roof, so we could not have a roof mounted flame. It would have uh, not worked. We ended up with a ground mounted, uh, floor mounted uh, cauldron and it weighed 16 tons compared to 300 and used about 10 times less fuel 
but it was still very symbolic and uh, had a great sustainability story behind it. It's also really important then to do um, uh, report, effective reporting. And we worked with the GRI to develop um, a particular sector supplement on sustainability reporting for events. And uh, you see here the sequence from our strategy through different stages of reports pre-games through to a final post-games report. And it's important that these talk about not just what was achieved, but the challenges and learnings from events, because that then helps create legacy for the next time. And what about the place? This is a great quote from Simon Barnes in The Times uh, in July 2012, explaining how most sports events tend to be in these big, hard, tough and compromising places that are awesome, but not really homely. And in his experience, the first time going to London 2012, he felt that it was going to be happening in a nice place. And that is something that all sports events should replicate. But that sense of creating a natural environment using um, ecological principles to create the parkland uh, landscape was a real factor in what made the London Olympic Park so, so very special. So bringing all those things together, our sort of understanding of what actually makes up a sustainable event is a range of these things. So it's not just simply about one green initiative or a bit of technology. It really has to be something that goes into the whole heart of the experience of an event, as well as the, the practical things that we, that we delivered and that it does create some positive legacy. And from some of the stuff we did, we are seeing now uh, the fruits of um, it being fed into the mainstream of many other events. So work we developed in terms of sustainable sourcing codes and the whole process of integrating sustainability into the event supply chain has now been picked up and have their own code for their own supplies directly, as well as producing guidance for all future organizing committees on sustainable sourcing. And similarly, we developed a methodology for carbon footprinting using it more as an impact assessment rather than a reporting tool so that we could use initial estimates of the footprint to inform decisions on venue design, procurement strategies and different materials. And in the same vein of, sort of process and methodology legacy, there's the ISO 2012-1 um, sustainability and management system standard, which was an initiative we conceived back in the days of the bid when we recognized there was a gap in the market for a proper management system standard relevant to events rather than the generic ones that were in the industry at the time. And so London was the first uh, major event to be certified for this, but it is something that's been picked up widely around the world. And just a few examples here, there are many, many more, but all Olympic organizing committees are um, required to do this now. It was a feature of the Euro 2016 in France. Um, Roland Garros, the uh, venue for the French Tennis uh, Open, has achieved certification to the standard. And it's uh, been seen in Formula E, America's Cup, and many, many others. And it's not just been picked up in sport. Some of the, there's a list here of a number of uh, major events on different types of events from the World Economic Forum's annual meeting, to uh, the COP24 in Paris, the G7 coming up in Metz this year, and even the Eurovision Song Contest in Malmo, Sweden in 2013. All these have been using the standard, the management system standard we initiated in London. So what's next? If we're looking at future events, there are still some big areas where sustainability really needs to be um, uh, taken further forward. One of the big challenges is around legacy reuse for temporary venues. Most what called temporary venues are pretty big structures. They have to be to take, what is it, 5,000, 10,000 people or whatever it might be. So they're not small buildings. And the design and engineering choices to achieve a true circular economy approach are still something that needs working on further. It's not just a question of taking the venue, dismantling it and putting it up somewhere else very often component parts can be modified into other uses. But the key thing is to make sure that what goes into a temporary venue comes out and has a high value reuse somewhere. 
either in whole or in part. Another major area is temporary power solutions. Uh, diesel generators are going to be a thing of the past, but they are having backup power for major events outdoors and even um, indoor ones is something that broadcasters really insist upon. But can, what temporary power solutions using clean technology are going to be available? Paris Games coming up in 2024. Diesel is going to be banned in the city. So not only just cars, but um, generators too. So they'll have to have a new generation of, uh, of, of solutions. And that comes back to the point I made earlier about fleet-wide vehicles and having the right mobility solutions for the, the context of the, of the city. And can the new technologies like 5G be a way of limiting the physical demands and scale of broadcasting, which um, is one of the biggest impacts actually of, um, of an event. If you look at the size of broadcasting centers and the amount of space they require and the energy used, um, finding solutions there would be a great way of limiting actual impacts. But at the same time, recognizing that broadcasting is one of the vehicles that actually is, 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 is what makes sport so popular and um, is um, a way of reaching so many people. And then the whole issue around single-use plastic, not just straws and beakers, but look at all the soft plastic that's being used as packaging and film around um, materials. That's something that the sports sector and the event sector as a whole can do a huge amount to, to work on. So to conclude, um, a sustainable approach to sporting events can really add value. It can achieve cost savings and resource efficiencies. It can improve sponsorship revenue. It's something that's uh, really important around reducing risk. It reinforces um, an, an organizing committee's license to operate. It improves public relations and through innovation it can set up great legacies. I'd just like to make a quick shout out to the Volvo Ocean Race which took place last year and they had done a huge amount of work on sustainability and it was a great focus around ocean health and there was science mixed in with communication and with, with fundamental underpinning performance of, of the event organization. And so that's one of the leading examples. This is for some further reading that uh, you may be interested in. And anyone who wants to um, look at these um, in more detail, then I'm sure the, uh, the slide deck will be available um, after the, the webinar. Or you can do a quick screen grab in the next two seconds. Um, but well worth reading some of these. Uh, and this is just a selection. There's a lot of literature out there on sustainable um, uh, sport nowadays. And just to end on, this was in the Parisian, um, in fact this morning, and there's a number of articles I'm seeing in the French uh, press at the moment picking up how London has been a, a really strong example and influence on the way that the 2024 Olympics are going to go forward. And they've got some really interesting innovations that they're going to develop for their construction and event operations in just over five years time. So on that note, I thank you very much for your attention. And it is now time to hand over to Dr. Karen Lee, um, who's going to talk about the role of social innovation in achieving sustainable development. And then we'll be back to answer questions uh, jointly afterwards. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, David. Um, I'm sure you'll all agree that was a really fascinating insight into sustainability and sport. Um, I'll just provide a brief introduction to our next speaker, Karen. Uh, Dr. Karen Lee, CM, who joins us in a personal capacity, is a Chartered Environmentalist by the Chartered Institution of Water and Environmental Management, SIWEM. She is an expert in policy research and sustainable development and environmental management and environmental impact assessment. She's also a freelance columnist with Education for Good at the Hong Kong Economic Journal, sharing case studies on social enterprises and environmental protection. I will pop back to ask your questions to both David and Karen at the end of Karen's talk. Over to you, Karen. Thank you. Thanks, Sarah, for the introduction. 
As uh, Sarah's mentioned, I have been involved in uh, building quite a number of uh, business models for um, social startups. And today is uh, really my great pleasure to share with you all um, uh, how important it is uh, for social innovation in, um, and in the concept of uh, sustainable uh, development. So I'm pretty sure you're all very familiar with the um, uh, concept of uh, sustainable development with these three um, colorful circles. And basically the idea is that we cannot um, use all the resources and we need to make sure our next, next, next generations can uh, still have uh, enough resources to uh, use as well. Um, the UN set up this uh, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, uh, the SDGs. Basically, the prime aims of the SDGs is to reduce global poverty and to improve our well-beings. So when you have a detailed look at the SDGs, you will find that quite a number of the goals are related to our well-being. And the SDGs have then become a very important root of many of the social, economic, and environmental issues. So just like the clean water, uh, sanitation, and climate actions, many different um, cities on Earth um, uh, nowadays they have that uh, climate action plan um, to combat the climate change, for example. Social innovation is significant because it supports efforts to dissolve the traditional boundaries between the public, private, and the civil society sectors. Social innovation emerges and develops in the context um, uh, of shifts in the role of and relationship between all these uh, three sectors. And it also sees the enhanced use of the private, public, private, and philanthropic support. So how can we define a successful social innovation? Well, in the market, you can see that this not only fulfill existing needs, but also sparks off needs and desires that did not exist, or at least were not consciously articulated before. So it's something new. We need to create um, something um, which can then become a major driver of our economic development as well. So in Hong Kong, uh, we see social innovation that uh, could be exemplified by the advances in the knowledge, uh, kinds of products and services uh, with the applications of their existing business models, uh, processes and methods to meet our social needs. When we get back to these three colorful circles, we all start in here, our human desire, and then we, for some of we would like to achieve something. We want to solve something, uh, the some uh, issues, and then we make good use of the technology and also um, uh, the business models to achieve that. If we get into more details in the dimensions of the concept of sustainable development, if we look at the um, economic center, well, obviously we need to um, use all our resources effectively. We need to optimize our social welfare and communal uh, facilities as well. If we look at the social center, obviously we need to enhance the social interactions between the individuals and strengthen the community identity as well. If we look at the environmental center, uh, obviously it pops up in your mind might be we need to enhance the environmental comfort and also to minimize any kind of impacts uh, to the environment that brought by, for example, infrastructure projects as well. If you look at more details in um, the overlapping sectors between economic and social sectors, you need to vitalize our local economy and to enhance the linkages between the individuals and also between the communities or neighborhood. If we look at the two sectors between economic and environmental sectors, um, nowadays, just like Dave mentioned, we need to promote the use of renewable energy and to minimize any um, single-use uh, disposal waste and to balance the, between, uh, the development and the conservation as well. If we look at environmental and the social centers, some people might think of we need to integrate green landscape planning in our uh, urban design and also to enhance the environmental awareness via a number of outdoor family activities, for example. So in accordance with the latest EU report on the social innovation, 
how to achieve a better future. The outcomes are then put into all these four pillars that you can see here, social, educational, economic, and environmental sectors. As you can see from the figure here, what implementing all those uh, UN uh, SDGs goals into these four sectors, a new governance practices can then give preferential treatment to specific civil society groups and particular forms of stakeholder engagement. And then if we come up with a new form of governance to empower the civil society and to steer uh, social changes. One of my favorite quotes is from the Albert Einstein. He mentioned that we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we create them. So what does it mean? It means we need to be innovative. And you might ask, who can be socially innovative? Um, most people, um, believe me, they will think of charity because you know they, they do all those terrible um, events and, and activities. But nowadays, for example, in hospital, they do have some kind of devices to help the elderly or those uh, physically in need. Um, they create something to help those people to improve their well-being. Actually, many parents, they're socially innovative as well. They, they teach their kids to um, uh, do all these uh, different exercises and, and to join different activities, trying to uh, make them more creative. And obviously, social startups or social enterprises, they, are, they need to be socially innovative. And you and I can be socially innovative and to drive the social changes and uh, the behavior as well. In terms of the policy arrangement, it's very important that the policy makers understand and propagate the benefits and impacts of social innovation. The policy makers have to be transparent. They need to collaborate with, uh, you know, even with different uh, backgrounds and parties, and then learn to overcome deficits and the conflicts resulting from social innovation. The policy makers also have to create all these uh, innovative hubs to enhance the diversity of the uh, social innovation and innovative ideas. They need to think and act um, in the medium that's in long term as a societal settings um, because it takes time to implement all these innovative ideas. Now I would like to take some time to share with you all some examples that we come across um, as well. In Hong Kong, we do have a Social Ventures Hong Kong, SVHK, which is founded in 2007. It is an impact purpose organization that innovates social change by re-imaging the city. They mainly focus on inventing, incubating, and investing in social startups or social enterprises that address urban social challenges in Hong Kong through sustainable and innovative business solutions and inspiring a culture of social innovation. They do provide funding for the social startups and to um, uh, promote the idea of the social innovations in Hong Kong as well. I think some of you might heard of um, the idea of uh, ocean garbage patches. Nowadays we have big, huge ocean garbage patches um, on Earth. The Ocean Startup actually um, founded by a Dutch inventor, uh, Boyan, um, at the age of 18. He is now just 24, uh, which is really brilliant. Um, this cleaning up the Great Pacific Garbage Patch using conventional methods like vessels and nets, it could take ages, like thousands of years, and really you know, costly to do that. So the Ocean Cleanup invented passive systems which estimated to remove half of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch in just five years, and just at a fraction of the cost. So it's really cost effective. The system consists of like um, 600 meter long floater um, that sit on the surface of the ocean with a kind of like a seal curtain um, underneath the water. And then just imagine that the floater provides buoyancy to the system and then prevents all those plastics and the garbages from flowing over it while the seal curtain underneath stops the um, garbage from escaping underneath. So you can see that both the plastic and the system are being carried by the current. However, wind and waves propel only the system but not the um, uh, garbage underneath uh, the water and then so they can imagine it, they can trap lots of um, uh, garbage all at once. It's a very innovative idea that's um, uh, 
really help to solve the environmental uh, problem. The other one is uh, known as Michael Bay, a guy called uh, Caesar. He's actually a French. And um, uh, you, when you look at the picture on the uh, left hand side, um, uh, all those tools uh, hanging uh, uh, on the wall was actually from uh, marine vessels. He made good use of those um, uh, tools and the equipment or devices that's left over and then try to promote the idea of uh, upcycling and then he promotes all this idea of environmental awareness to the kids and then he lets the kids to use all this equipment to create something out from the garbage so um, it's really really impressive idea um, Mecca Bay is an inclusive industrious and innovative community of experts from all different backgrounds they have uh, artists and scientists so, uh, engineers as well their mission is to develop a sustainable civilization through social and environmental impact so they collaborate with WWF Hong Kong, and then they invent a kind of device, just like a, um, uh, to simplify, is a, a GPS tracker. They want to check how far our rubbish can go to. And then it's very amazing that, uh, but pretty impressive, obviously, um, our garbage can go all along the coast uh, to Taiwan. So um, they, they also promote the idea of, you know, to ban all those single-use plastics, ask people not to, you know, uh, uh, to uh, use those unnecessary uh, things as well, and uh, not to just dump the things um, in the ocean as well. The other one that um, is a willpower challenge, which just established a couple of years ago. It is a non-profit initiative which strives to co-create an inclusive society for all different kinds of people, um, even for um, those physically in need. Through organizing many different experiential programs, um, the founders, they believe that it can challenge our stereotypes in our society and bring about insights into the connections of the environmental design and our daily lives. And they also drive advocacy for a barrier-free society. So you can see this uh, pretty amazing uh, wheelchair. Um, uh, the founders are uh, standing at the back. They actually got the idea from uh, the boy uh, who couldn't really walk and he hasn't you know have a taste of how the ocean tastes like and then so um, they invent this kind of uh, wheelchair and ask the boy to uh, you know sit on it and then um, uh, pull him to the uh, sea and then just let him to swim a little bit and then that boy is really really happy about it so uh, we power challenge also uh, promoting you know a barrier free hiking trails and just let those people with wheelchair to have a taste of uh, hiking as well is very very um, impressive the picture on the right corner uh, uh, the top corner is from uh, Hong Kong so you can imagine a city urban um, a place like Hong Kong how many plastic bottles we consume every single day um, where we did have a, a very serious typhoon hit uh, last year and the year before last year as well and we got huge plastic waste being flushed off on on the uh, coast and on the beaches as well so um, this is not this doesn't really only happen in Hong Kong but also um, in many you know coastal uh, city as well so urban Spain um, is the uh, um, uh, other uh, social enterprise that I would like to share with you all is established in a uh, couple of years ago as well it has been redefining um, the drink water drinking experience outside our home by building this innovative refreshing water with field um, network system in Hong Kong as well um, urban spring innovates a smart water dispenser so um, it really looks cool uh, many school children they uh, put their plastic uh, not really plastic but their water bottle inside and then they press the button and then they can see how many water bottles they could save every time when they refill their own uh, water bottle uh, it's pretty amazing that in Hong Kong on average about 1.5 million bottles of water that we have consumed per day so um, this well uh, got the idea of um, uh, promoting uh, asking people not to use that single uh, plastic uh, water bottle
to water as well. And such idea has been, you know, adopted to many green events and um, like marathon, like the Austrian trail walker, uh, the, like the hundred kilometers uh, hiking uh, trails uh, events in Hong Kong as well. In our convention exhibition center, we can actually purchase um, uh, the uh, uh, water uh, distilled water as well. We can choose how much of the volume by size, you know, um, that uh, we want. So um, it helps us to save the uh, number of the plastic bottles that we have uh, used. Um, here, I just uh, because of the uh, time, I just uh, share with you all some of the examples that we have in uh, Hong Kong and how it's uh, very important to have this uh, social innovation idea um, in the sustainable development uh, concept. And such idea is very important um, in, uh, for a city uh, like uh, Hong Kong because it can provide solution to lots of social and environmental issues while at the same time making sure that we have a long-term economic uh, growth. So um, uh, I'm happy to answer all different uh, questions. Thank you. Many, many thanks to Karen um, and also to David for their insights. Um, I very much hope those watching have found the webinar useful so far. But just to start with some of the questions we've already received. This is particularly, I think, um, relevant to David's talk. Um, David, any successes or otherwise of the use of reverse vending or deposit return schemes at events? It's an interesting area and some events, I think particularly festivals and um, I remember even as far back as 2006 the, when the World Cup was in Germany, there was um, an initiative to use, uh, have reusable uh, cups and uh, glasses for for people um, especially at the fan zones rather than in the stadiums it's not a simple matter because when you're dealing with the mega events you've got a whole range of different situations and if you're trying to manage the uh, the materials coming on and off site um, there might be a variety of different solutions so in London we decided because of security and the operational issue of the, uh, the fact that a stadium will unload in, in one go and you've suddenly got 80,000 people looking for lunch and you, you've got to be really smart and quick on things. So what we did, we had 12 different caterers that were procured for the, the games. All of them were contractually required to source all their um, consumables, the plates, cups, glasses, etc., from uh, a single supplier that made compostable and recyclable materials so that they all fitted the waste streams. Uh, the trouble is if you have lots of different types of materials coming in at different sizes and different uh, composition, you can get in the right old muddle with your waste stream. And, and sometimes um, it might be a good, seem a good idea, but the practicalities of, of delivering it uh, make it really tricky. So it, there are, moves in a number of events to to try and use more reusable materials uh, as suggested here but um, it's not always universally easy to do oh, brilliant thank you for that um just a question for karen um what what do you think policymakers can do to create an environment where social innovations can develop and thrive yeah, it's, um, th this is a very good question because um, uh, sometimes it's really um, hard to ask the policymakers to have open-minded because they 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 kind of like a stereotype and um, whatever policy that you uh, launch, you can please everyone. So sometimes it's quite uh, depressing to have innovative idea. But I guess um, the policymakers they need to be innovative is um, is. Uh, very important. They need to um, have an open mind and then they need to communicate with uh, different um, sectors and also different um, ages as well, like uh, the teenagers, like the uh, kids and also um, parents, uh, etc. So um, uh, in Hong Kong, many, many 
I'm uh, teenagers or or the young generation they got involved in um, uh, all these uh, social uh, startups as well and then they um, have their own ideas and our governments really uh, promote this social innovation um, as well okay br brilliant thank you for that just another question for David um, Qatar's environment minister said that the 2022 FIFA World Cup will be carbon neutral is such a thing achievable well those who know me know i'm not a great fan of labels and slogans like carbon neutral carbon positive or zero carbon and so on because it's actually quite difficult to be to to measure absolutely and in a way it is just a slogan what is really much more important is what is being done to reduce emissions and to to drive change such that other events and other so yeah just really um carbon neutral um i find difficult because you've got to define your scope really carefully and there are so many things which um may be associated with an event are they included in this calculation and um, uh there's a when you look at what is it you actually control in terms of building and managing venues and all the operations but there's so many other externalities what about all the different organizations coming and putting on their own events around it do they count uh, so carbon neutral if it's limited within the parameters that you've tightly defined there's still a lot of other stuff that's out there and unless you double or triple offset you're probably never going to strictly speaking uh, achieve carbon neutrality and I just think it's a distraction from the main purpose of really measuring properly what your emissions are and using that um, information to try and uh, drive down emissions through better design, better use of materials, better procurement policies and much more effective resource management. Brilliant, thank you. Um, another question for Karen. Um, yes. As social innovations are by their nature participatory and inclusive, um, I wondered if you could just speak a bit about how the projects outlined in your talk have helped to increase social cohesion. Yeah, um, those programs, as you can see, they uh, they got a, a vision at the beginning. Like uh, for example, the World Power Challenge, they got a vision to have those um, uh, physical in need to you know have a taste of how the ocean like, uh, or to go for hiking, for example, and or for urban spring, the the program they call the Well. So they. Um, have a vision to reduce the number of plastic bottles, etc. And then they come up with all these kind of um, uh, programs or the environmental awareness campaign and to attract people's attention. They make good use of the social media, so IG, for example, uh, Facebook, etc. And then they create different kinds of events um, uh, and also activities to bring uh, different uh, families or um, uh, even uh, get down to the grassroots uh, uh, people as well. So um, they try to uh, make people feel that uh, all their programs or their products or their services they related to our daily lives. So that's how they create a um, cohesion. That's, that's great, thank you. Um, just another question for David. Um, a question about the sustainability reporting for the London Games. Mm -hmm. What standard and structure did the team use for the report? Right, so we recognise that events and sustainability reporting, there, there wasn't really a great high standard in, in the literature at the time. And we wanted to do something um, uh, much more comprehensive. So we worked with Global Reporting Initiative um, the other part of UEFA was alongside us and um, governments of Switzerland and Austria because they'd been the co-hosts of the Euro a few years before. And we worked together to develop the, um, a sector supplement, as it was called, within the GRI uh, system uh, specifically for the event sector. So uh, we basically followed normal GRI process, but with a particular a number of modifications if you like which were relevant for for events and that's the the standard we use but um, all those reports that we did 
are available on the Learning Legacy Archive website, which was one of the links in the presentation I, I gave you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I think my colleague Phil has a question. I do, I've just picked this one up. Um, it's about the IOC supplier code and the mm -hmm. carbon footprint methodology. Um, yeah. Would you be able to find a little bit more detail into one or two of the things that are included in those documents uh, for, for future events to, to go from? Okay, um, if we take the, the sourcing piece first of all, this is um, really setting out a, a range of processes um, to ensure that sustainability is embedded in your, in your procurement. So it's uh, alongside setting out some core principles and requirements, uh, a key part of um, having an effective source approach is getting it into what we called in London our procurement governance model. So making sure that sustainability is clearly identified as a criterion both in specifying the, the tenders but also in the evaluation process and no, not just to weight it as a sort of numerical thing and then it always gets outscored by other factors but to, to ensure that it is something that's actually very determinant in, in the choice of supplies you use. Um, the supplier code of the IC, I think, is um, more of a uh, sort of an overview, setting out uh, what they require of their suppliers and making them aware very much of the sustainability criteria. But behind all that, there's a whole range of internal processes that need to be um, taken on board. And when it comes to um, sort of the larger events, you've also got to consider dealing with allegations and complaints and uh, disputes in the supply chain which can be a very difficult if you are sort of six months in advance of an event you've got suppliers who are one-off suppliers effectively because you're going to dissolve after the games and then somebody comes along and says there's something wrong with the supply chain so having a, a whole complaints and dispute resolution resolution mechanism and being able to investigate and respond effectively those are all things that we had to develop and um, that sort of principle and approach has now been incorporated into the more detailed guidance given to future organizing committees quickly on the carbon thing um, it is first of all scoping out exactly what is included so there's a there's a whole section around a sort of decision tree of how do you decide what is in scope and what is not in scope uh, it includes a lot of technical details around the calculation of um, GHG inventory um, the different segments that should be included in it the emission factors and and the general principles based on GHG protocol but recognizing that was not really adapted for event context and um, both those documents and others are again on the IST sustainability pages in their website another one of the links that I put on the, on that slide thank you for that David uh, a very good overview of documents that I'm sure are quite detailed <laughs> very sorry so <laughs> yes. not so and all afternoon going through them but no, no. we haven't got time for that a good summary um i've got a very quick another question for you david um and it's around a sport which actually featured in one of your slides um rather than an event itself it's about formula e um, mm -hmm. has formula e given a profile higher profile to electric vehicles and has it um demonstrated a, an impact on sales growths for mass market electric vehicles well i think there's a number of things that, that obviously the electric vehicle market is rapidly growing rapidly um formula e um is part of all that picture so i don't think well i'm not aware of data showing exactly whether the whether one can really chart rise in um demand for uh, electric vehicles with the advent of Formula E. What I think they have done, which is really important, they've made electric cars, um, people more aware of them, and they're desirable and cool. They've, they've created this amazing urban sport that a lot of young people go to because you know, I'm just travel out to some race course miles away uh, from town. And they've got a whole sort of exciting festival atmosphere around it and it's it's an entertaining sport and so 
the old image of electric vehicles that will putter along at 10 miles an hour and then die at the end of the road, no battery. <laughs> they've, they've come on a long, long way. And now um, people are looking at electric vehicles as something really desirable. So, so that's, that's interesting. And on the sort of technological side, they're doing a lot of innovative work with their partners around things like battery recycling, because one of the problems with electric vehicles is what happens to all the dead batteries afterwards. So there's some interesting innovative solutions being developed there to ensure that they can be recycled in a high value way. So effectively a closed loop system, which um, will feed into the next generation of electric vehicles. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I guess it's time just for one more question um, for Karen. From the project examples that you gave in your talk, um, it's clear that an awareness of the integration between the social and environmental is key. What more can be done to increase understanding, do you think, of their interconnectedness? I guess it's um, through the experiential learning, it's very important that people, they can have a taste on, or they can have a hand-on experience on um, uh, those products or services that's um, provided by the social uh, startups or those uh, social innovation uh, project maker. So, um, uh, through the experiential learning, like for example, the garbage tracking device that I talk about, the people that can uh, really see it on the screen to track the uh, garbage on uh, where does it uh, go to so um uh, and then they can have a sense that okay we we, we cannot uh, uh dump so much uh stuff and uh to um, maybe go for a recycling of the uh, garbage as well so um, i guess experiential learning is um, one of the key brilliant thank you uh, yeah, unfortunately, we, um, we've run out of time. Um, so my colleague Phil is just going to give a brief overview of our webinar recordings and some of the fantastic opportunities coming up. Thank you very much, Sarah. And, uh, and thank you to uh, Karen and David for some excellent, excellent talks. If you could just um, please stay tuned for a moment longer. We have some opportunities coming up that might be of interest to you. So... Uh, as mentioned at the start of the webinar, this is our last of the, the webinars in this series around innovations. So thank you to all the Chartered Environmentalist speakers who have been involved. Uh, feedback from our webinars has been really positive, so we are cracking on with organising some more expert-led series, uh, and they can be found on your screen at the moment. The next series, which will be coming up in the summer, has the topic of a sustainable built environment. We have confirmed two or three speakers so far, but we are looking for more CM Van Arum Tech speakers to complete the series. So please do get in touch if you're interested or if you know anyone else who might be interested from your network. Details of webinars will be released shortly. Um, so don't forget to opt into our email newsletters um, to receive notifications about those. Future webinar series have the topics of climate change, a 2019 perspective, and a business case for the environment, natural capital in your business. If you're interested to hear more about becoming a chartered environmentalist or registered environmental technician, uh, please take a look at our how to become and why become recorded webinars on our website. Uh, whilst there, you can also find the recordings of series two, which is around waste reduction, and part one and two of this innovation series. Uh, recordings are also available on the Society's YouTube channel. Uh, now, coming up fast is our annual World Environment Day Awards and Lectures event, which takes place on the 4th of June, which is the eve of World Environment Day at Kew Gardens. We have an excellent uh, Chartered Environmentalist speaker lineup um, to discuss the umbrella topic of net gain, including Nick Blythe and Claire Wandsbury, as well as the added bonus of tours of the Q facilities, which can't be missed. We will also be discussing the global UN environment theme for World Environment Day, which has been recently announced as air pollution. Now, I'm going to give you a webinar exclusive announcement. We haven't told anyone about this yet, apart from our uh, webinar viewers from the last webinar which went out last week but we are excited to announce that we have Dr. Teresa, Teresa Coffey MP joining us on the day to provide insight into the environmental work taking place at DEFRA and beyond. Um, 
Dr. Coffey is the Parliamentary Under Secretary of State at the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, aka DEFRA. So don't miss this. Um, the tickets are free for chartered environmentalists and registered environmental technicians. So it's an excellent benefit of becoming a registrant as well as the many other benefits. Um, if you're an aspiring registrant or an interesting party, uh, you're not quite, you're not a uh, CM or an RF tech yet. The tickets are available uh, via our website at the moment. Um, so if you're interested at all, uh, please head to the website that's on the screen and uh, register for the event. We look forward to seeing you there. The last thing to note for today is the Society's prestigious uh, 2019 Environmental Professional of the Year Award is now open for nominations. Uh, nominees must be either a chartered environmentalist or registered environmental technician, but anyone can make a nomination. Uh, if you are a CM for an R of Tech, you are more than welcome to submit a, no a self-nomination, which is a regular occurrence, so uh, don't let that uh, put you off nominating. Uh, nominees will be judged on the extent to which they have made a difference whilst demonstrating an outstanding record in the four main competencies in CM and RM Tech registrations, as well as a fifth criteria that underlines the exceptional outcomes of their work. Uh, the deadline for nominations is the 1st of May. Uh, in previous years, we've had some fantastic examples of the work and achievement of uh, environmental professionals, and we'd love to for you to showcase your work this year. So please again head to our website uh, on which is noted on your screen at the moment and uh, make a nomination uh, and that's it from us today uh, thank you for listening and taking part if you are watching the recording on YouTube um, please subscribe to our channel to gain notifications for new videos when they happen and hit the big thumbs up like button uh, that would be great if you're watching on our website please click on the YouTube button in the bottom right to get to the subscribe and like options so that's it from us um, thank you to Karen David and Sarah and uh, we'll be we'll see you in the next webinar so thank you for watching <laughs>